Okay. I am going to ask you some questions and you are going to not use your calculators. Right? You can have them out, but I'm going to show you that you don't need to use them for the kind of questions I'm going to ask you. The only time we're going to use our calculators is if you raise your hand and you say, I don't believe you. And then we can ask our calculators and settle that argument. Okay? So what if I asked you something like this? Um, our resultant, remember, a resultant is just the overall measured vector. How far, how fast, how much? The components are the individual vectors in each direction that make up the overall result. So what's the kind of So we'll start off easy. If I go um, 100 miles, And at an angle of, let's say, 100 degrees, but I'm redundant, angle from the horizon, so I don't have to be redundant. There are some things that we should be able to see that are calculated, that we don't need to calculate. That's what I'm trying to hit you. You know, when you're going to be working with a thrower, a javelin thrower, and let's say they're not optimal on their angle. Are you going to get out a calculator to do it? No, you're going to have to be able to kind of see, hey, you're throwing it too shallow, you're throwing it too high. We need to point. Like, we're going to have to use these, this light eyeball data in the real world unless you have a biomechanics lab. So I have to teach you how to see things that are there. And it's rough estimate. It's not perfect. You don't necessarily have to round up to the PMT decimal place. I don't care. But what this should tell us, this should tell us a few things. 100 degrees from the horizon, 90, not there yet. 100 degrees is the same as saying 10 degrees past 90. I'm in quadrant two. So that means whatever my Y, that, that means I have to have a combination of X and Y. If it was 90, it'd be all Y. Great, there's no, there's no combination of X, it's all Y. It's a straight line, no trade in straight line. But once I drift over, even one degree over, I'm in quadrant two. My Y component, whatever that is, is gonna be north in this case if we're using distance, right, up. And my X is gonna be west or negative. But here's the part that I need you to be able to see on the test. Whatever the numbers, I'm traveling a heck of a lot more north than I am west. I'm, I'm traveling a heck of a lot more up than I am to your left. Does that make sense? So you should be able to know without a calculator, the y is positive, the x is negative, and my y is going to be greater than my x. If I did this, And again, our X and Y for this one is just, because I'm trying to get us to C, is going to be just replace X and Y with north, south, east, and west. Okay. So again, what do we know? <clears throat> well, let's get there. Not there yet. Not there yet. Just got to go 20 more miles, right? 20 more degrees. Made it. What quadrant am I in? Three. So right away, I know that my Y is going to be negative. So in this case, I'm going to be traveling south, and I'm going to be traveling west. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It just gives me an eyeball of where I'm at. Now, if I was halfway, meaning that the X, I'd be traveling just as much west as I am south, I would have to be 45 degrees from 180. Does that make sense? So if I did it globally from the horizon, I would have to be 180 plus 45, 225. I'd have to be 225 to be halfway. It's a horribly drawn out. I apologize. But I'm not. I'm, I didn't make it to 45. I stopped at 20. So again, that tells me that my X component 
has to be greater than my walking point. I have to be traveling more west than I am south. Now, what the components are in this case are both displacements, right? Distances. The last examples we're going to do with the forces that they're both pushes. We're going to use some desk analogies. We're going to get up and use some analogies. But the senses of those pushes can be different. Friction is still push. It's a microscopic push instead of a macro push. They're still pushes, but they're a little different. So in these examples, distance is distance. The x distance, the y distance. We're going to go to velocity examples. The y component velocity, the x component is the same thing. The one weirdo is when we start to get into pushes, those senses are a little different. It's not a, a macro in both directions. It's there's a component that's literally trying to push directly into it, and there might be a component that's trying to slide against it. Okay. All right, let's do a velocity. First of all, any questions about what you should be able to see without needing a calculator? It, hopefully, you get to the point where Campbell, I hope 30 of the questions is this. Cool. All right, let's do a couple velocities. Um, I'll lose so much stuff. That's ridiculous. Yay. Let's do some velocities. Now, um, you guys in physics or some other classes, when you publish, if you publish, if you go to conference, you're going to read things in um, uh, SI units, standard units, and so it'll be meters per second, meters per second squared, and meters. But this is mer. All right? And in America, we do miles. So my point, though, is that there's an app. You could go on Google if you do need to transfer stuff. But we don't have life data. In fact, when I hear that so-and-so um, broke an Olympic record, they jumped five point something meters. Dang. Oh, great. That's awesome. Right? I, I don't have that comparative data. And so for our class, because I'm trying to teach you how to see things, we're going to use things that we're familiar with. Like miles per hour or miles or feet. Okay. You just convert it if you like it. All right, so my resultant is going to be a resultant velocity. So let's say I throw, I personally throw a baseball 95 miles an hour. All right, let's be realistic. I throw a baseball 75 miles an hour. That's what I popped out at. Every pitch I threw was a changeup. All right, that's cool. There's only four instances where if I release that ball at 75 miles an hour, there is no X and Y component. That's if I release it right at zero, if I release it right at 90, 180, or 270. Does that make sense? There is no Y when all of it is an X. There is no X when all of it is an Y. Okay. That's rare. Like, you have to be perfect, and there is no perfection. Odds are, if you throw anything, kick anything, the statistics say it's going to be in some combination of ups and downs, fronts and backs, X's and Y's. Okay. Okay. So let's say I chunk that ball with all my might. The ball flies, my arm flies off, like my arm flies off at five miles an hour. Let's say the angle is... 44 degrees. Open-ended question. What can we what can we tell? Like what are some things we can say without the use of a calculator about that resultant and its component vectors? What's that? Absolutely. And that tells us. I, in fact, I love that you started there. The fact that you identified it as quadrant one, it's like, okay, you establish quadrant one, and then from there you can say, so what does that mean? That means the X component has to be positive and the Y component has to be positive. I love starting at the quadrant. Like, that's a great step. Where am I at? Okay. What else can we tell about this given information with no calculators? Yes, absolutely. 
And I, I love the layman's terms because that's what we're going to be using. You know, we're not going to be working with people and be like, mm, positive why. You're going to be using concepts for positive and negative why ups and downs and lefts and rights and forwards and backs. Okay. So I love that you stated it like that, Olivia. It's more the velocity is traveling more of the baseball yoink, yoink. Not a lot, but it has more, a little bit more here than it does there. Forty-five would mean that the how fast it's going to the right and how fast it's going up would be the same magnitude. They'd be the same. Now that being said, they would still both add up to more than the result. We'll talk about that trick, right? But the x and y component, and we could we could test that, like we can do. We can, and that's what I love about like I didn't say put up your phones because you know sometimes we can kind of. You know, say, well, that doesn't kind of seem right. And then we could say, well, let's ask our scientific calculator. So we could say 75 sine, and we get that percentage. Oh, 75, that's the magnitude. Come on, again. 45 sine, and we get a percentage, like 70%. And then we could say 45 cosine, 70%. But if we do 44, it's a little bit more to the right than up. 44 sine. 69% of, of that result of is, and then you say 44 cosine, 72%. So you can see how, and that's what I was trying to emphasize about tree. Our brains are linearly thinking brains. Humans are linearly thinking. What I mean by that is if I have four apples and I double it and I have eight apples, I kind of roughly know what that means. But we don't think curvilinearly. We don't think two more of this equals eight more of that. Like our brains don't think curvilinear. Our brains want to say, well, at 45, if they're both 70, then at 44, they should both shift the same. <laughs> That's not what happens. It's a curvilinear shift. It's really cool. And so, but why it's important is because when you guys are working in clinics and working with athletes, small angle changes give huge changes in results, especially when you consider distances and application over you know distances. Small angle changes, little bitty details are actually significant because of this curvilinearity and trigonometry. Great, great question. Okay, let's do another one. Let's do, so we should be able to tell direction and we should be able to tell which is greater just by knowing the resultant and where it's applied. Okay, let's try another one. 75 miles an hour, but let's say, because it doesn't make sense to do it with a baseball. So let's say um, the top NFL quarterbacks throw a football like in the 60s. So let's say I, I Bless you. I always get this confused. Let's say someone scores a touchdown, and let's say it's not someone from San Francisco. Sorry. Too soon. Sorry. So let's say uh, someone scores a touchdown, and they go to spike the ball. So they spike the ball, so it leaves their hand with a loss. Okay? And in this case, they're not throwing it up or throwing it down. So let's say the ball leaves their hand at 50 miles an hour and the angle of inclination, yoink, let's say is, let's see, 300 degrees from the horizon. Does that, does that make sense where we have to keep saying from the horizon because that's like an anatomical position? You know, because again, if I said 45 degrees from what? So I could say like, I'm, I'm not saying this is for whatever, so I could be like 45 degrees from zero, 45 degrees from 90, 45 degrees like this, versus a global anatomical, so at least you know where you're at, then you can break it into the quadrant. 
So that's why we that's why we, we do that. Okay. All right. Is the football traveling faster in the up down or in the left right? What's that? In the up down. Specifically up or down? Down. Yeah. Right. So it's going to be traveling faster. A majority of that 50 miles an hour is going to be going down. But some of it is going to be going to the right. Does that make sense? I think I used this analogy uh, before I got sick. But I, I want to emphasize kind of some of the applications of what we're talking about here. If an athlete is doing a vertical jump test, yes, there's force involved, but force is influence motion. At the end of the day, how fast they leave the ground is going to be a function of how high they go. Just another way of looking at it. If, if I toss the ball in the air, if it leaps my hand at a higher speed, it's going to go higher. Yes? Okay. So the kind of things I want y'all to start to look at is if somebody is doing a vertical jump and they're trying to go as high as they can, that means they're trying to go as fast as they can at 90 degrees from the horizon. And if they don't leave the ground and come back at the exact same spot, then there was some wasted energy there. If I jump up and land forward, it might have been 89 or 91, but I wasted a little bit in the X. And like I said, it may not seem like a lot, but that little bit of trig actually yields a lot more in the result. Little bits. Okay. Any questions before we go on to forces and the friction questions? Okay. And I think this is good because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you how I'm going to ask these questions on the test. These are the kind of questions I'm asking the test. All right, let's do some forces. You supply, I'm asking this one because you can do it. Okay, you can do it. You are leaning on you are leaning on the desk with a force of 70 pounds. Mm, why don't you say Newton's? Shut up, Mark. At an angle of, now we're going to have a little fun with this. At an angle of, let's say, 250 degrees from the horizon. This information should tell you who is feeling what, like logically speaking. If there's a force of any magnitude and it's being applied, not there yet, not there yet, too much, backed up, that's what the table sees. That is me pushing on the table. That makes sense? That makes sense? The table feels this. So what do we know about that? Well, the table is feeling negative Y push from me. True? Like in other words, I'm trying to push the table down. And I'm also trying to slide the table to the left. True? I'm pushing down more than I'm trying to shift it. So in other words, my, and that's what a normal force, that's what they call a normal force, it's just the component that is compression. It's the component that is direct macro compression. That's all that is. Here's where I'm hoping we combine some stuff from the past. If the table feels quadrant three, 
I have to feel quadrant one bad. The table is pushing up on me, preventing me from falling over. True? And then this is the hardest part, but it's really not hard because I think we gradually stepped up to this. The table is producing friction this way, preventing me from sliding. Look, see how it's starting to slide to the left? Well, what's preventing that? Friction I feel from the table this way is preventing me from sliding. So this is the first time where the nature of the components weren't exactly the same. When I was throwing ball, speed, speed, velocity, velocity. When we were doing displacement, distance, distance. This is the first time where the nature of the X and Y were two different types of influences. In this case, the ups and the downs were comp pushes, were normal forces, were compression, direct pushes. And the X's were friction pushes. If your brains work similar to mine, it should be so will that mean Y's will always be macro and X will always be micro? Not at all. It depends on where's your macro. I said this on the, the, the home video, America's boringest home video. I said on the home video. You can have compression without friction, but you can't have friction without compression. How can I try to slide two surfaces against each other when they're not touching each other? Okay. So an example, we're going to go um, example. First of all, any questions about this? This tells us logically who's feeling what, because the table has to feel the, the down push from me. So that has to be the table feeling that. And on the test, I'm going to tell you, like, you know, this force is being applied at an angle. So then you have to be like, okay, it's going down. The ground is going to feel down force. I'm going to feel up force, right? Like, we have to be able to make that leap of logic. Is that what's going to be opposite? What we feel, that's Newton's third law. Absolutely. We have to feel, and I think that's super cool, right? Like, we have to feel if, if I'm not feeling friction from the table, Table's not feeling friction for me. I'm not pushing on the table. Table's not pushing at me. I'm giving my results in quadrant three. Table's given results in quadrant one. Great question. Okay, next one. I am pushing against something, leaning against something. Let's see if we can figure out what. For the life of me, I'm always going to get this wrong. You know what it's like for me with this eraser? It's like when you're trying to plug in a USB and you're like, nope, nope, yeah, please. nope, 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 yeah. It just doesn't fit. And then all of a sudden, like after the third try, it's just so weird. All right, I'm leaning with a force of 50 pounds. Ooh, I like this. At an angle from the horizon of 165 degrees. Where am I leaning? Am I leaning, so my question is, am I leaning on a table or am I leaning against the wall? And if it's a wall, which wall? No. Does that make sense? The wall feels this. If we had a fancy three-dimensional scale, this is the vector that it would show. Our brains need to say, well, that's cool, but that's fruit salad. That's apples and oranges, literally. 
how much of that resulted is apple and how much of that resulted is orange? How much of it is trying to push through the wall and how much of it is trying to take paint off the wall? Two different questions. If somebody was trying to literally break down the wall, they would smash into the wall. But if you're trying to remove the paint, you can try to scrape the wall. Two different kind of pushes. Right? So on the test, it would be like, what direction? Or what these are some kind of questions I'd like for you to be able to see on the test. What type of force? What's the nature of the force that the wall or that is in the Y? What would be the nature of the Y force in that example? It's friction. And we both feel friction in the Y. That's why I don't have to. If I was going to give a direction of Y, that would be, well, who's feeling Y? The wall would be, I'd be trying to scrape paint up. The wall would be feeling positive Y friction for me. So therefore, I'd be feeling negative Y friction from the wall. Think of it like this. If I scrape my hand up against the wall, I would leave a trail of dead skin cells. I don't know that sounds Down relative to my hand. Or if I had red paint and I slid it up the wall, wouldn't I leave a trail of red paint below my hand? Because literally friction from the wall is dragging that paint down relative to my hand. So would the X be the compression? Yes. Absolutely. It would be the exact same, uh, it's not the same answer, it would be the same concept as this, except on the hand. So in other words, the desk is preventing you from falling down. The wall is preventing you from falling across. What was the question? I'm sorry. No. Yeah. I'm sorry. You get that? For frictiony things, it should make sense that like compression is going to be the more dominant. You know, think about it. If you're struggling to open something. What do you try to do? You try to get a better grip on it. And you've got to press those surfaces. You've got to interlock those imperfect surfaces so that you can create this microscopic push machine. So for this example, would you be going more left than right? Yes. Well, the wall would be feeling more left. Correct. I would be feeling. I just want to make sure we're, we're communicating who's feeling what. Mm -hmm. So in the in the, the given that I gave you, 100%, there would be more force being applied in the negative x to the wall. Absolutely. Absolutely. Think of it like this. Much more compression than friction. Probably not going to slide. Do you see that little experiment? Right? As I lose compression, <laughs> I lose friction. And it's the friction that's actually preventing me from sliding. So it's it's really weird. You need the compression to serve as like a parameter for friction, but friction itself is not compression. So it's not the right compression. It's not normal. It's, it's abnormal. That's why I think they call it normal. Friction is just abnormal. So if you get this example, so if I say it's closer to 90 degrees, mm -hmm. then the same thing you said, yeah. you could say that compression would be greater than, like it would be opposite in that sense. Compression well, would be greater and then friction would be less. Yeah, the, well the friction is going to be less because I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm closer to 180. So like, for for compre for friction to be greater than compression, I'd have to be at like an angle that would be steeper than forty five degrees from ninety. So like I'd have to be at one twenty or something. And by that time, I won't have a lot of friction that I would fall over. Right? Um, you know, it, it's we're about to do um, a shuffle ground example because I think that's pretty applicable. 
think about it. When you're doing cone drills, or like uh, we used to do, uh, you know, shovel drills, when you go to change direction, what's one of the strategies you do? You drop it low. You get down. You you compress your foot into the ground so that you can have more friction going the other way. You don't change direction with straight legs, optimally. Like you don't run and like, and you cannot compress your feet into the ground with a straight leg outside of your ankles. Think about it. The only way I can push more than my weight is to plant a foot. So that's why like in athletics, They'll say, I don't know if your coaches are like my coaches, but they'd say, like layman's terms, like, get in an athletic stance, get ready. All that means is that now I'm in a position to be able to push on the ground with more force than my body weight so that I can travel with components where friction is a part of it to influence my motion perpendicular to the compression. Make sense? And understanding that friction is dependent on compression and what the surfaces are made of. That's why sometimes when you're playing on the court, you're just like, man, this court's sliding all over the place. So you gotta clean out those imperfections. You gotta get that dirt off those imperfections so that you can have interlock between your shoes and the court. Or clean out the court. Why do you think it's more dangerous right when it starts raining? Because that water mixes with the dirt and the dust in the air to create like a mud and it kind of gets in those imperfect surfaces and you see it. But after it's been raining for a long time, it washes away that mud and it's actually less. It's just water. It's no longer water and dirt. No longer water and mud. Okay, how about this one? Um, get into groups. Well, it doesn't have to be, but 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 let's do like uh, small groups. And if you're a lone wolf, that's cool. I'm a lone wolf too. But we're going to do a simple kind of vertical jump or a broad standing broad jump. So in other words, we're going to go up and across. Okay. Specifically, we're going to use this scenario that we're doing a we're doing a standing broad jump in a biomechanics that where we actually measure your force. Like we actually know how much you're giving the ground, thus we know how much the ground is giving back to you. Okay. So this is what I think is gonna be cool. Let's say we measure a peak force of 400 pounds at an angle of 170 degrees. Now, before you say, well, who's feeling what? That actually tells you, that suggests, am I asking you about the floor or am I asking you about yourself? Does that make sense? Okay. So now what I would like for us to do is get up, whether you're back there, obviously just be careful with the steps. But it doesn't, guys, we're not like competing for trophies here. But I would love for you to just be like, okay, at that instant. So in other words, this is a working knee. This is just like peak. Like just, there's going to be different forces as you go up. It's going to be less. It's going to be more. So that's just like, what was the top amount of force that was at? But what I would like for you to be able to do is, okay, how much of that force and what type of force? What was the X? What was the Y? What direction was the X? What direction was the Y? What did the floor feel from me? What did I feel from the floor? All those things we should be able to answer without a calculator. If you want to be able to see it, like in other words, can't okay, well, I hear what you're saying, but I don't quite feel free to use your calculator to kind of see this greater than that. Y'all understand what I'm asking y'all to do? All right, one, two, three, three. Let's get up and hop around. Easter's coming. Hop around. Hop around. Hop up, hop up, and get down. Hop, 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 hop. 
Remember. I'm giving you a big clue. Going this way. Up and across. Going this way. Y'all know why that was so important that we know where we're going? So that way we know exactly who's feeling what, right? So I'm trying to give you that extra, that extra clue. Um, All right, guys, I'm changing. I'm changing something really quick because this is ridiculous. This is that was ridiculous. I, I just want to. I'm going to blame you and say that that is an impossible scenario, and for that I apologize. I'm still going to give you basically the same thing, but I'm going to give you a more realistic angle. Um, let's do. Because basically, what I told you was that like you have a microscopic amount of compression, it's a huge amount of break. That's Sorry. Nothing changes in terms of who's feeling what, but it's just more realistic. Okay, so who's feeling this? Me or the ground? Who's feeling 400 pounds at an angle of 120? Me or the ground? Who's feeling 400? Who's, feel, who's feeling that 400? Well, we're both feeling 400. But I'm saying, who is feeling it at an angle of 120 from the horizon? Me or the ground? It's got to be me. Or like Justin Timberlake says, it's got to be me. That was so dumb. But think about it, guys. The ground can only is only going to push up on me, right. right? So if I'm in quadrant two, that's a big indicator that that's what I'm going to be feeling from the ground because of the upward push. What quadrant would the ground feel for me? Four. Good. The ground's going to feel down. In fact, if this wasn't a solid four, if I was on the beach, I'd see that. If I jumped, I'd see a crater left for me pushing down. Ground. Does that make sense? Okay. What direction then, if that's what I'm feeling, then we should be able to identify the direction of friction that I feel from the ground. If this is about me and what I'm feeling, and I'm in quadrant two and I feel quadrant two, then I know I'm going to feel upward push from the ground and I have to feel negative X friction from the ground. In fact, it's that friction that's making me go across. It's, it's, the push from friction from the ground that way, that's actually going to influence my motion that way. In fact, think of it like this. Would it be harder to do a standing broad jump on roller skates? You bet your butt it is. And it's not to go up. I could jump up on roller skates. It's when I have to try to get friction to go across that bad things are going to happen. Sure, sure. This is what I feel. I know because of the, I feel push from the ground. Okay, so I know this is what I feel. This result in this quadrant is made up of a Y component and an X component in quadrant two. Does that make sense? Because we're in quadrant two. The Y is gonna be positive, makes sense, pushing up. But the X is gonna be negative. Because remember, it's direction, negative X. Yeah, absolutely. You have to feel negative X friction from the ground. 
You have to go. Think of it like this. If I was going to jump in the sand, wouldn't I push sand back that way? Because that's what the ground feels for me. I feel this back from the ground. It's just a direction. It's not like I owe friction. It's just the direction of the friction. Okay? Any questions before my follow-up question? Talk to me about what stopped you. So in other words, this is what got me going, but when I hit the ground, what speeds up must slow down. What stopped me in the up-down, and what stopped me in the across? Does that make sense? If I was on roller skates, I might want to slide and fall. So something had to stop me as I fall down, and something had to stop me as I drifted across. So I'm asking you to tell me what forces and in what direction stopped my motion as I fell down, and what force stopped my motion as I was drifting across. Does the question make sense? Okay. So in the first one, we talked about what sped me up. Now I'm asking you to just tell me what slowed me down. going to speed me up. Because remember, F is equal to MA, right? So positive Y push from the ground is going to speed me up going up, and negative X friction from the ground is going to speed me up going across. What I'm asking is, is as I'm drifting in the air, eventually I got to slow down. So when I hit the ground, I'm wanting you to tell me what slowed down my motion in both the up, down, and the across. So as I'm coming back to the ground, I have negative velocity. I'm moving down. So what's going to stop me from going down to the, you know, to the center of the earth? I'm also drifting across. What's going to stop me from continuing to drift across? And I'm asking you to identify which specific forces in what specific direction. That's really what the question is. What did it and how did it do it in terms of direction? So what's going to stop you? What's going to stop you? If you're falling straight down, what's going to stop you from continuing to fall? Answer so that way we have a little time for questions, okay? When when I when I leave the ground, right, I would actually do a broad jump, but I mean I don't know if I have enough room. Uh, yeah. When I leave the ground, 
I, there's no more. I, once I leave the ground, the ground can't influence anything. And, and I can't, like, like just, just like the ball. Remember when we toss the ball? Once the ball leaves your hand, you can't influence the ball anymore. So it's like the ground is the hand on the ball. Once I leave the ground, I'm done. Gravity will slow me down as I go up, and then gravity is going to speed me up as I come down. That wasn't my question. There's going to be nothing in the X, so my, my X velocity is going to be constant. The Y is going to slow down as I go up, speed up as I come down. Then I'm going to hit the ground again. What I feel from the ground is a quadrant one resultant from the ground made up of positive y that's going to slow me down as I fall down, right? I need a positive push to slow me down, just like somebody who jumps out of an airplane needs a parachute and the air pushing up to slow them down as they fall down. So I need the positive y push to slow me down, and I need positive x friction to slow me down in the across. Again, Think of it like this. If I didn't have positive x friction slowing down my motion in the negative x, so I have negative x velocity, I have negative x motion, f is equal to mx. Does it make sense if I have negative x motion and I'm trying to slow down, wouldn't I need positive x force? I'm running, I have motion in the negative x and I'm trying to slow down, wouldn't I need positive x force to slow me down? So I would need positive friction to slow me down. If I feel positive x friction, what kind of friction would the four feel? Negative x friction. They have to feel the same, just in opposite directions. And again, if I did a standing broad jump in on the beach, and I did this, I would push some sand forward, because that's what it feels for me. And I feel that that way. The only thing that would switch is the friction. Why is the same? Absolutely. Because the ground's got to give me up. Ground's got to give me up. Absolutely. The only thing that would change is when I would jump off the ground, I would feel friction this way. And when I go to land, I'd feel friction that way. And I'm going to say the last thing I'll say. I still got three minutes. I won't keep that broad jump example. We do every step we take with gait, with walk. When we walk, when we heel strike, friction pushing back against us pumps our heel from slide. And then when we go here, in fact, this wrap is in your packet. We go from if I'm walking this way. I feel quadrant one. Eventually, I'm going to be all Y. I won't have any friction. I'm going to try to slide me. And then at toe off, I'm going to be in quadrant two. Friction. And then friction. Telling. It's the same thing. Just more magnitude when we're trying to jump as far as we can. All right, guys, I hope that was helpful. Y'all have a great weekend. Yeah, no problem.